everyone, welcome to today's LRD Spring Faculty Webinar Series. This series, we're focusing on the ACR, ACRL Framework for Information Literacy for Higher Education. And in today's session, Chris is going to walk us through the specific frame that focuses on uh, scholarship as a conversation. Just as a reminder, for attending the session live today, you will receive a certificate of attendance. The session is being recorded, and we will have time for Q&A, both recorded and unrecorded. But the recording should be posted to our YouTube page by Monday at the latest, and you will get a notification of that. Um, so I just want to say, Chris, take it away, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. I'm Chris Anglin. I'm a, a reference librarian and archivist and uh, uh, special collections librarian here at uh, University of the District of Columbia. I've been here for 15 years. So uh, what do we mean by uh, scholarship as conversation? I think we'll start off with that. Uh, the idea of uh, sustained discourse within a community of scholars, researchers, or professionals with uh, uh, new insights and discoveries occurring over time as a result of competing perspectives and interpretations. This is from the frame and uh, uh, that um, you see in here the link to the frame, uh, the ACR, the ACRL frames and standards. So some reflections on the on the frame, exactly what we're talking about in terms of scholarship as conversation, are that uh, we recognize that a uh, given scholarly work may not represent the only or even the majority perspective on the issue at hand. We understand we understand that students are entering in the middle of the scholarly conversation, not the end. Could Critically, so we uh, ask them to critically evaluate contributions made by others and, see, and also to see themselves as a producer rather than as a consumer of information. So um, this, uh, in reading this, this reminds me of uh, the whole idea of Burke's Parlor and uh, the whole idea of Burke's Parlor and scholarship as a never ending internal conversation is that uh, you enter into, where you enter into a parlor, the conversation has been going on for, for generations. Uh, the scholarly conversation has been going on for generations in some cases. You're entering in the middle of the conversation. Uh, you listen, uh, then you get uh, an idea about what's going on. You make your, uh, uh, you make your, perspectives and viewpoints known, you uh, agree with some people, you disagree with other people, uh, uh, you may change your mind in some areas, you might uh, uh, put up a strong defense in others, others may may decide to join you, and uh, the converse, and then it's time, it's your time to leave, and the, however, the conversation continues to go on. So uh, what does Burke's Parliament mean for our students? Uh, scholarship is like a conversation where ideas are created, debated, and weighed against each one another over time, information users and creators come together to discuss meaning with uh, the effective researcher, add, adding his or her own voice to the conversation. Uh, skills and abilities to learn and join in the scholarly conversation are that uh, uh, you understand that uh, that we try to get our students to understand that the research process gives the student a chance to participate in an ongoing scholarly conversation in which information consumers and creators join uh, in sometime, and many times uh, the uh, a person is a consumer and uh, information consumer and creator at the same time. In fact, a lot of them are. And then they join and negotiate meaning. You have an opportunity that, to join the conversation and uh, then we ask, uh, then we should ask, have you sought a variety of perspectives? What are the modes of discourse is there in your field? Do you have uh, uh, information that, that you would uh, need to cite your sources? And what are the established authority structures that uh, favor certain uh, voices and, and disfavor other uh, voices? Uh, so you need to understand that uh, sometimes that there's a, a, a information disparities and these information disparities that need to be uh, overcome. So uh, key, uh, key skills to teach and learn, uh, look behind and ahead of a source. Uh, who does the author mention in their work? Uh, why does he mention them in the work? And who mentioned this source, uh, namely the uh, a source that you're studying in their work? So uh, 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 as we said, uh, uh, 
scholarship as a conversation means that the scholarship or the conversation has begun before your time and will continue after your time. So in this continuum, uh, you're looking to see where uh, the context of where this uh, work fits in. So you also want, need to find its purpose. How does a source contribute to its subject field? Does a sort re source refute, support, or contribute to knowledge? And uh, in what ways? You need to learn the jargon, the jargon of the particular field that you're talking about. What is the structure and language used in the discipline? And then uh, we urge, we want to urge our students to make their mark. What do you have to say about the particular subject? Understand, understand your place in the field and know that your voice matters. So uh, now we'll move on to some of our teach and learn uh, classroom type of activities. Uh, uh, these are some of the, uh, more, but first of all, let's look at some of the learning outcomes for scholarship as a conversation. You examine the bibliography, uh, footnotes or references, uh, section, sections of sources. They find to locate additional sources of information. Some steps in this process include identify different genres of sources, books, articles, chapters, and so on. Identify the appropriate search tool, whether it be catalogs, and database, discovery layers, uh, scholarly sources, Google Scholar, and so on, to locate each genre source of source and then use uh, the search tool effectively, then uh, teach them how to use the search tool effectively and efficiently to locate and access uh, the source. Some of the uh, learning outcomes that we hope to have uh, for scholarship as a conversation is that we hope that the student explains the metaphor of conversation to describe the purpose of research and also to identify the contribution of specific scholarly pieces and varying perspectives in scholarly conversation within a specific discipline. And also uh, to contribute to uh, the scholarly uh, conversation at an appropriate level, either by creating new knowledge or by offering criticism of existing research. And uh, uh, hopefully a combination of both and to locate and analyze uh, sources that cite a particular source in order to evaluate the impact of that source and to find more information on the on the topic. And then uh, and lastly, uh, at least on this list, identify the functions of uh, different uh, sections of a scholarly article, especially the, especially the, the uh, literature review as appropriate for this discipline. So uh, one example, one uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, classroom activity is evaluating uh, news sources. And uh, one of the systems, one of the uh, uh, source, one of the tools that are useful for this and one that's uh, new to me anyway is called Alt Altmetrics, which teaches about fake news sources. So you teach undergraduates to collate and evaluate news sources with uh, Altmetrics. Uh, the sort the uh, tool includes slides for the learning activities in the chapter from the book teaching about fake news lesson plans for different disciplines and audiences. These slides include uh, goals, definitions of original research, the uh, a scholarly conversation, alt, -met alt metrics, and a uh, in class activities. And I've included the uh, link to Sandbox into the alt metrics uh, site. So uh, what, what is the connection between Altmetrics original research and uh, the scholarly uh, conversation? How are they connected? Altmetrics encourages online engagement and conversation surrounding the, the various sources. And, uh, and this, again, that conversation surrounds uh, 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 fake news, what, what makes up fake news, uh, what fake news is or is not. And then in terms of uh, classroom activities, uh, one of the uh, 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 sources that I think is, is very interesting and a group that's very interesting is, is, produce, is uh, New Literacy Live, and they produced a scholarship as conversation tutorial. Through this tutorial, it has an assessment that introduces the concept of scholarly conversation developing over time and how to follow up a scholarly conversation. What type of research do you need? Uh, provides an infographic that helps students find out more uh, information about uh, peer-reviewed articles, including uh, uh, types of secondary articles like meta-analysis and meta-synthesis, uh, excellent source 
It's an excellent source for scientific literature searching and the uh, conversational nature of the sources. Students are asked to examine them. Two magazine articles that are different uh, parts of a larger, more complex conversation. It includes a com uh, complete lesson plan with a script and articles to read. Another one is another uh, a tool that is uh, very useful, I think, is Classroom Resources, the first room, uh, first year experience cookbook, the first year experience cookbook, scholars in training, solving the mystery. Uh, from the first year experience cookbook, it introduces first year English and ESL composition students to uh, the differences between uh, uh, scholarly and popular sources. A and another one, another source that is also very useful, I think, is uh, Inform Your Thinking, Research as a Conversation. Uh, this is out of the, the Inform Your Thinking video series by the Oklahoma uh, State University Library System. It introduces students to the framers of the ACR framework and an easy to understand student-led conversations. This video introduces students to the uh, scholarship as a conversation frame by comparing research to conversations between different voices that each uh, cont contribute to a unique perspective on the topic and the question uh, worksheet is available uh, uh, for the videos. So uh, in terms of some of the classroom assignments uh, 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 provide, you can uh, want to uh, one example of a, of a classroom assignment is to provide uh, students with a list of three to five sources from uh, different perspectives that shape a, uh, the conversation surrounding a, a topic of interest, sample sources, a news article, a tweet from reputable sources, a scholarly article, and a literature review. Ask uh, what perspectives are presented, who has the strongest voice in the conversation, and why. How would you involve yourself in the conversation? These are all questions that uh, you would uh, would have the student to answer. And then uh, ask the student to conduct an investigation of a particular uh, topic from uh, its treatment in the popular media, and then trace its origin to uh, in conversations among scholars and resource researchers. How, uh, and the uh, whole idea is to, uh, discuss how have our perspectives changed over time and why. So some sample sources would include news articles, uh, tweets from reputable sources, uh, uh, magazine articles and uh, blog entries and uh, even best-selling novels. So all of these would be uh, uh, good examples of uh, what you could uh, uh, discuss in a classroom assignment. Another uh, classroom activity is uh, called Jigsaw where you're looking at uh, uh, where you have one table ser uh, searches and uh, USA.gov, another uh, discovery, another census.gov. And so you mix and have this, basically it has the student teach each, each other about these sources. You distribute a, a diagram of citation chaining, then have uh, the students do a chalk talk, which involve the value of citation chaining and any uh, question that they may, might have. The learning outcome out of Jigsaw is that. Students will learn how to understand and analyze a scholarly peer-reviewed article and identify and understand all parts of the article. In terms of the uh, online discussion board, three groups have, uh, have at least a, a different art research article, you create a concept map of uh, theoretical concepts, each offer their own uh, concepts, two uh, short sentences to discuss each uh, section, and uh, two peers uh, respond. So uh, in, then there's a blended course, which has four groups, each get an article, you have a group discussion, and then the groups get a large uh, uh, group worksheet on a concept map. The context, uh, in context, the students need to find uh, three relevant and scholarly articles for their topics after demonstrations and time uh, to find their articles, each student shares and uh, their articles in small groups to get feedback on the level of authority and relevance of these particular articles. And then you have a think, pair, and share, which is an introductory activity in which you have the students think about what questions they would have to ask to determine a, a, a particular claim, a, a, a particular claim or validity. And uh, then another activity would be padlet.com that contributes words or pictures on the topics of cited articles, citing articles, and uh, citation chaining. And through these uh, uh, learning exercises and assignments, uh, learners uh, uh, become information literate, become information literate, they cite contributing 
they better they're better able to cite uh, contributing works of others in their own work they contribute to uh, scholarly conversations at an appropriate level such as a, a local online community guided discussions undergraduate uh, research journals conference presentations and poster sessions they also uh, would be able to identify barriers to entering uh, scholarly conversations through various uh, venues uh, to uh, critically evaluate uh, contributions made by others in participatory information environments, identify the contributions that uh, particular books, uh, articles, and other scholarly uh, uh, works have done to uh, uh, disciplinary knowledge, summarize the changes in the scholarly perspective over time on a particular topic within a particular discipline, uh, recognize that a, a given scholarly work may not represent uh, only or even the majority perspective of a particular issue. Um, one, uh, there are many uh, aspects of where a discussion on a uh, scholarly conversation could go. I, uh, in speaking for myself as a uh, uh, disabled individual, uh, a formerly disabled student, uh, uh, not, uh, continuing a uh, disabled professional, uh, I can speak to, uh, uh, to this part of, uh, uh, to this conversation, uh, it would, I would, uh, to engage disabled students, I would anticipate that uh, uh, your some of your students will have disabilities, and in many cases, they're undisclosed disabilities. I think uh, more institutions are doing a better job of uh, of asking students to disclose their disabilities beforehand, but as in entering uh, in the admission process, and also. Uh, uh, should adapt uh, their teaching styles to uh, uh, meet universal uh, accessibility standards. Uh, and these uh, accessibility standards uh, cover the whole range of disabilities, whether, whether they're being uh, hearing speech uh, or uh, visual disabilities, mobility uh, disabilities, and so on, uh, proactively eliminate the barriers that cause students with disabilities to fall behind or fail to learn. And uh, uh, the professor needs to be aware of uh, the uh, uh, needs of the of disabled students and accommodate them and uh, go beyond accommodation. Also uh, adjust uh, uh, the work for individuals uh, with uh, by their individual abilities and learning styles, be aware and to teach appropriate uh, uh, etiquette in uh, working with uh, disabled students and also uh, help dispel uh, myths about uh, disabled individuals uh, for uh, other uh, members of the class uh, using uh, 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 the opportunity and the uh, 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 opportunity of working with uh, uh, disabled peers to uh, dispel myths about their uh, inability or uh, and uh, to encourage a celebration of uh, differently abled individuals. So uh, some of the uh, resources that uh, will be uh, helpful for you include the ACRL, ACRL framework for information literacy sandbox. L the link is there. Uh, activities to use at uh, the framework in teaching allows you to uh, share your own activities on teaching the framework. Uh, then there's Project Cora, a community of online uh, research assignments. Uh, the link is there. This is an OER, Open Educational Resource, uh, a collaborative space for adopting, uh, adapting and experimenting with uh, research assignments. Uh, it has uh, several uh, reliable and reproducible research assignments enhanced by user feedback, uh, the best practice, uh, obtained by a study of user feedback. It includes a, a teaching uh, toolkit with uh, resources types such as pedagogy, theory and assessment, classroom activities, technology tips, uh, uh, subject guide, citation tools, and information liter uh, literacy tutorials. And then uh, uh, the YouTube video that I certainly uh, recommend that everyone who is interested in this topic, uh, uh, particularly uh, faculty members uh, should uh, uh, be acquainted with is Research 101 and uh, also share this with their students as well. Research as a conversation on YouTube. And uh, uh, so uh, I will uh, now uh, open this for, uh, for questions. And if you have any questions or if there's uh, uh, anything that uh, uh, we can cover or any uh, uh, further points that uh, you would like uh, for the explanation on. I see some 
comments in the chat. That was just me linking all of your uh, resources in the chat. Oh, okay. Um, Thank you. I did want to say I've dropped also a feedback form in the chat. Uh, we'd love to hear your feedback today. And as a reminder, we will be sending out certificates of attendance to those who attended live. Uh, we would like this to be a conversation. So please jump in, share your thoughts, ideas, what you've done. I see AD has her hand raised. Yeah, I, you know, thank you for this one. Um, I was hoping I could be like given a little bit more insight on altmetric. I'm really interested to use this. Um, and I've seen- um, It's a know, great, I, it's a great tool. I, I definitely uh, recommend uh, uh, using it. And uh, certainly in English, I'd say that as being a, a real uh, a great uh, class to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, teach this particular topic. Yeah, so I, you know, I, I went to the, to the website um, and I found that there were several gradations. There was school, researcher, um, institution, business, et cetera. So I, I wanted to know if UDC has like a, like a subscribing system or like, like is this like an individual login, uh, you know, sign-in system or how, how do you make this work? Uh, you're talking specifically about all metrics? Mm -hmm. I, uh, I'm not aware of, uh, of uh, UDC in specific using this, I'm, uh, I can find out for you to make sure and, uh, and get back to the group if that would be helpful. Thank you, much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. One way, um, a, a way you can show sort of alt metrics without actually using, you know, the alt metrics platform is to have your students actually do research from Twitter. A great thing for them is to go into the search terms and see the key, you know, put in a key term and then they can see the sort of conversation that's happening around it. And then they can see what related hashtags there are, who's talking about it, who's not talking about it. It's just Twitter is something students already engaged with. And so when you, you go onto that platform, you can show them this is sort of altmetrics and happen, you know, in action. Um, so you can get an understanding of what's out there with the caution that you can tell your students, some of these could be bot accounts. Um, and that shows them how, you know, some conversation is forced conversation and it, it purpose, purposely skews the bias. Um, another resource I like to use, hang on, I can't type and talk at the same time, um, is this wonderful website called Media Bias Fact Check which can show the conversation happening around specific topics or going through specific news outlets. And what this resource does is it also looks at the bias of these various news outlets. And it tells you about specific ways they are biased, who is funding them, who's writing and things like that. Um, this one's very important, particularly when, when we get into election um, and political material. So you can see the conversation there. What I like about this website is that it provides a whole encompassing look of both topics and organizations. Um, and it, it does live fact checking on things that are going around. Is that the one that prog provides us a graph that uh, shows uh, the various news outlets on a continuum? Uh, for example, uh, Washington Post uh, uh, leaning more towards the left and National Review uh, being more towards the right? Uh, Pete beat me to it. That's a, a slightly different news source. Uh, the media bias chart comes out of Ad Fontis Media. Um, they also offer a lot of webinars that they put together, um, walking you through how to use this in the classroom. Um, the platform itself, like the updated chart, you can freely look at that, but there is pricing for some of the individual material inside of it, but it's a nice way to see the chart in action of who's where on the spectrum of do they skew left, do they skew right, do they skew more fact-based, do they skew more, you know, complete fake news. Um, and a lot of students have fun with this one because the chart is designed with logos. And actually I can do a quick uh, screen share here. Do you want me to stop? Uh, I Because I've got control, I can do it. So as okay. you can see here, you can see the media bias fact. Yeah, that's what I was thinking um, of in action. Now, um, this version is free, but there are other, you know, more robust tools that uh, would be required for pay. But usually for a classroom activity where you're just trying to show bias, 
just posting this uh, is interesting because some students are like, oh, I read that all the time. Oh, I had no idea. Um, so that's just something to think about uh, using in the classroom. But I like uh, the Media Bias Fact Check Organization because it goes more deeply into why they are biased, how that came to be. Are they designed to be that way or did it just so happen that's how they, you know, historically they got there through their editorial board? As a matter of full disclosure at this point, I think I need to uh, divulge the fact that my brother works for CNN. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I feel like I should bias. I used to work for my senator, a Democratic senator on the Hill, but that, that was, you know, way, way long ago. Um, you know, but these are, you know, some things that students, they sometimes think, oh, if the news says it's, it's true, but all news outlets, except for maybe AP and Reuters, um, all news outlets have a bias. It might be a little, it might be a lot, but every single news bias, because people write these stories. Yeah. So everything has a bias. And um, what's interesting is one of the classroom activities, and this actually came up in our previous webinar, is to ask students to compare different things around a tweet, an article, and maybe like say a political cartoon all around the same topic so that they can see, oh, this said this about this subject and this said that refuting what they said. Um, and then it's always fun to ask, OK, but whose voice is missing? You know, whose voice, you know, what would you add to this conversation? What expertise do you have? Why is your voice missing? Um, and asking them to jump in and then become a part of that conversation. Um, another thing I like to do is to show uh, people, a uh, Google Scholar um, has a wonderful, I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna screen share. Google Scholar has, this is again, a fun free tool to use where you can put in, um, you know, students are going to Google anyway. So say you wanted to talk about um, affirmative action. What's nice about this is say you're like understanding affirmative action. Here you can see who cited this article and who's cited by. Um, so as you can see, you know, this one's 664, this 285. This shows them the conversation and action. So this one article is then cited by another 285, which are then in turn cited by 304, 176. And you know, it just goes to show how one article can be so pervasive in the conversation. And yet, if we go back to the beginning, some articles aren't, like some are small, some are a lot. And so this just goes to show how students can see how a scholar's work then spreads throughout the, you know, both the scholarly and just general conversation. There's also a feature in our catalog that's similar to that. It's, it's not nearly as robust, but if you look at a source and there's a little orange arrow that shows an upward split or a downward split, that's sources cited in it or sources that sources that cite it later. That's a good way of, uh, of uh, getting an idea of the authoritativeness of the, the particular and credibility of the particular article. Another another quick question on uh, undisclosed disability or non perceivable disabilities. So I don't use Zoom platform or WebEx platforms, which allows uh, closed captioning, right? Uh, but I don't use them because there are certain other things that students cannot do. Um, so I use the Black Blackboard Ultra uh, platform. So there is no closed captioning. Is there something that I could do or? You know, is there something that I'm missing here that that could actually enable, uh, a, you know, transcription? There are some students in my live class transcription who would better be accommodated if there was something, you know, that they were able to follow the script, you know? Yeah. So there are a couple of ways you could do this. There are I'm going to drop one in the chat. Um, there are web tools that um, make events um, uh, live transcription. Live, live transcribes are like their browser editions. Um, what you can also do is, depending on what level of PowerPoint you have, if you create PowerPoint slides, PowerPoint has a built-in live transcription function these days. Um, and if you use the university license for your PowerPoint, that is, we're up to date on that. Um, so that's how you can work around there not being live transcription in Blackboard Ultra. You can put it either using one of these um, tool, the tool I dropped in the chat, or if you already use PowerPoint, just turn it on there. The problem with uh, some of these, it depends on the microphone level. 
um, like if I was talking very quietly, it might not pick it up. So you have to practice um, working with these tools um, and emphasizing, you know, syllables becomes important. And sometimes it sounds like you are talking very, you know, like a robot if you want that perfect transcription. But for most students, the, it'll work. Um, and then what's nice about some of these tools is then you can get a printout of that live transcription. Yeah. And that is really very helpful. If you're hearing impaired, that's a, a really great, a great tool to have. Or for the students who happen to miss the session because of whatever reason, they can then mm. go read what was happening. Um, another good practice um, is while you're talking, put the salient points in the chat. Um, so if you're working from notes, just cut and paste the most, you know, the most important parts in the chat. I think highlighting uh, uh, key points is really a valuable part of the uh, of, uh, of teaching. It's a valuable practice, and the and the students appreciate that as well. To, to avoid uh, uh, losing uh, losing the forest because of the trees, kind of thing. Any other questions? Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording. Uh, I wanna thank you today for attending and we've got one more session left. So keep an eye on your email for that. Oh, good. Thank you very much, Megan.